Hello and welcome. I'm Cameron Abbas, the Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ, and I'm delighted to welcome you back to uh, a new season of our Known Unknown series. Uh, and um, it's a really remarkable series of webinars that we first ran during the COVID pandemic following um, an editorial by George Davy Smith and others, um, which was really helping us or reminding us that um, we must be careful uh, in terms of evaluating the evidence and the and the degree of certainty by which we can then draw any conclusions and make recommendations um and i think it was a very well-timed series it had uh, a great impact and was very very thoughtful so we're grateful to george david smith and alison pollock who helped create that first uh, series of webinars and i'm delighted to say they're back with us um that you may or may not see them on this webinar but they are in the background they've helped arrange these sessions uh, today and the future ones, and they will be helping us in particular today curate the questions. So very grateful uh, to both of them. Uh, but the purpose of the series really is to address uh, key uh, issues, ones that are causing particular, should be causing debates, <laughs> leading to debate and controversy. Often uh, the debate gets a little heated uh, on social media, people get very angry. Um, and I think what we need to relearn in a way following COVID is how to discuss evidence and how to debate it in a mature way and in a way that helps us be constructive uh, and do the best thing uh, for people and the planet. Um, so that's what we're hoping to do with this series. We aren't going to shy away from tackling difficult issues because that's not in our nature at the BMJ. We will tackle difficult issues. And uncertainty doesn't just mean that, well, we don't know, you know what to say or what to recommend. Uh, there are degrees of uncertainty. I mean, some things are more uncertain than others. Um, few things are definitive or definite. Um, and in, in that sense, we need to try and understand what do we know about this particular topic particularly a therapy area and what you know what don't we know and and what understanding what, what we don't know is just as important uh, as appreciating what we already know and where the evidence is at uh, at this point so welcome back this is the first of a new series of webinars and i'm delighted that i've got with me today uh professor susan bewley and the topic today is therapy for the effects of the menopause and this is I mean, it's not a new controversy i'm sure susan will confirm that um but it's certainly been given a fresh impetus over uh, the last year or so so we're here to discuss where things are at um and and so the format's slightly different as well susan and i will uh take us through this afternoon we're going to co-chair the session today we've got three really excellent possibly four excellent speakers today for you uh, one on video uh, and then we will be taking questions we want to be as interactive as possible uh, so do uh, do send us your questions share your comments in the chat uh, any direct questions any questions for the panelists put them into the Q&A box we've also got a, a, a particular question we want you to address this time around and it's there are two questions a two-parter what's the best thing about the menopause that's the first part of it and the second thing part of it is what is the worst thing about the menopause so what's what's the best and worst aspect of the menopause from your perspective and do put those comments into the chat space and we will review those comments and we'll attempt to summarize them and if any big issues and themes emerge we'll try and address them uh, as we go as well so uh that's that's a welcome from me. It's great to be back uh, with this series. Um, and now over to our co-host, Professor Susan Bewley, who's uh, Emeritus Professor of Obstetrics and Women's Health at King's College London. Susan. Thank you very much, uh, Cameron. Um, the menopause, we know it's the last period, but the perimenopause, the years around it, when women like the opposite of puberty move from one stage of their reproductive lives into another. and Thinking about the history, as you say, I have seen uh, the menopause be controversial, not controversial, controversial again. Um, why is that? What is the context in which we're having these discussions? Um, what is the context of women's lives? Um, and why is it important to think about the known unknowns? Well, because as you said, when you haven't got an agreement of facts, myths abound and people get uptight and cross. 
what patients and doctors are wanting are things that address the symptoms and they need a critical analysis of what works. But I think for here, we've got some issues around the boundaries of what this thing we are discussing is, we've got some context, and we've also got questions about where we get information, how we know it's trustworthy or reliable. How's that information framed? Is it the best and worst like we've asked you? Or is it if I do nothing or if I do something? Uh, is it in absolute numbers? Uh, how is it presented and what are my alternatives? So without further ado, if you can just keep doing your best word or phrase, worst word or phrase, let that pass as we listen to our next talk. Um, and then we'll draw on those answers. But back to Cameron to introduce the first speaker. But he's on mute. Oh, well, there you go. The host is on mute. Well, that's cl a classic uh, error. Um, but well, uh, uh, Susan, thank you for that. It's really good to have you with us. I think having your expertise with us is going to be really helpful uh, during uh, this webinar. Now, we've got uh, other speakers for you. So our, fir our first speaker is going to be Martha Hickey. Then it's going to be Gillian Reeves, uh, followed by Claire Hardy. And finally, Margaret McCartney. Um, and as we said, leave your best and worst in the chat box, questions for the speakers do put them into the Q&A box uh, and we will address them uh, as we go. So our first speaker is Martha Hickey. Um, she's chair of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Melbourne. She's the author of a recent BMJ analysis on the medicalization of menopause. It was um, a well debated paper. Um, and here she's taking a step back to look at the bigger picture and highlight where she sees uh, the uncertainty lie. We've got a video of, Mar of Martha. So Martha, take it away. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this BMJ uh, podcast on known unknowns. My name's Martha Hickey. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And my clinical and research interest is around menopause. These are my declaration of interests. So known unknowns in menopause, I hardly know where to start. We, we don't even have a consensus about what menopause is. Is it the final menstrual period or is it a year after the final menstrual period? There are different definitions. So what's all the fuss about menopause? There's certainly lots of um, fuss going on in the UK at the moment. Um, for, an, for an experience which is common to all of those born female at birth, I think it's, the, it's almost the only experience common to all females. And around 25 million women will transition menopause each year. The biology is ubiquitous, but the experience varies considerably. So first of all, uh, for known unknowns, why does menopause even happen in the first place? Well, nobody really knows. Um, it's thought to be due to the loss of ovarian primordial follicles. And these are all established during prenatal life in the fetus. And around about 30 weeks gestation, they nearly all die. And, and nobody knows why that is. And once um, that child is born, those ov ovarian follicles can never be replenished. So it would be fantastic to understand what actually regulates the size of that primordial follicle pool um, in, in during intrauterine life. So some women experience menopause that is premature or early, and this is another area of a huge uncertainty. It's estimated that about 10% of women have premature or early menopause. Um, some of it's iatrogenic due to chemo radiation, normally for, for cancer treatment, or sometimes due to surgical removal of the ovaries, a zoophorectomy. But in most cases, the cause is unknown. It may relate to that size of the primordial follicle pool and I talked about during fetal life, but nobody really knows. So another uh, chestnut is uh, what symptoms menopause actually causes. Well, about between 10 and 40% of women don't have any symptoms apart from change in their menstrual cycle. Uh, we don't really know how many women have severe symptoms. It's sometimes estimated as about 25%, but more recent data suggests it's more like 16%. And we've got no way of working out 
which women are going to have terrible men menopausal symptoms that are distressing or prolonged and which women are going to have no symptoms. There's certainly huge variation by race and by geography. So overall, although the biology is ubiquitous, there is no universal experience of menopause around the world. So HRT, hormone replacement therapy, is a big area of controversy in the UK and worldwide at the moment. And it is a very effective treatment for basic motor symptoms. It will reduce them by about 80%. Unfortunately, when you stop, about half the women who take it will have resurgent symptoms. And of course, there are effective alternatives to HRT now. There are non-drug methods like cognitive behaviour therapy or there's non-hormonal prescription medication. And the efficacy of that is creeping up. It's still lower than um, HRT, but with the introduction of new medications such as fez um recently registered in the US, we are going to see more effective targeted therapies. And whilst women might start HRT when their hot flushes start during the perimenopause or menopause transition, we actually have no data on the efficacy or safety of it until they reach the postmenopause, which is concerning. And whilst um, it's commonly stated that HRT has all kinds of preventive properties uh, in terms of chronic disease and long-term health, the best data available on this, the United States Preventive Task Force in 2022, did not recommend HRT to prevent any chronic diseases. So just to summarise, that's it. Hot flushes, no miracles. So who should actually take it? Um, in the UK last year, about 14% of women were thought to be taking it, and, but the, there is certainly discussion that that might be going up. So it's interesting to know uh, why, since 80% of women are symptomatic, why don't they all take HRT? And that's another unknown. Do women not take it because they can't get it or because they don't want it? Looking back to 1975, when uh, HRT was first introduced and, and widely available, The Lancet quoted that the prospect of a universal treatment of a large sector of the female population is clearly a, a glittering prize of the pharmaceutical industry, and hence it was. And what about testosterone, the other hormone? Well, endogenous testosterone, as produced by the ovaries, does not fall over the menopause transition, so it's not like estrogen and progesterone. Um, if you take testosterone, um, it does improve libido, but the effect is actually quite modest. Um, and the recommendations from last year only, you know, 2021, recommend only giving testosterone to women who've got a, a, um, a psychiatric condition called hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And it has no other clinical role. So again, the effect of testosterone is one more sexually satisfying event per month. That's it. So how can we support women better through the menopause transition? I'm going to just propose that we take a different approach and consider how we can empower women to manage this normal life stage. And these are some, some components of, the, of empowerment. Giving women realistic and balanced information, giving them tools to help them choose the right treatment. Those things don't exist at the moment. Um, access to a cl clinician who's prepared to listen with empathy and make decisions with them, access to effective treatments if and when they want them, and joined up care for prevention of chronic disease that doesn't rely on hormones because they don't work, and of course practical support in the workplace. And that is changing in the UK and that's fantastic. So we could also think about celebrating the contribution of older women. 40% of our workforce are women over 50. Uh, we've learned from COVID that most essential workers, like those in health and education, more than 70% of those are women and a large proportion also of the voluntary sector. So we can change the workplace to accommodate menopausal women. Um, at the moment, coping at work is one of the main reasons women take HRT. So another approach would be to change the workforce so they don't need to take hormones just to be able to do their job. We can also challenge the narrative of menopause as a hormone deficiency disease like diabetes or thyroid disorder, as has been very widely promoted. And I think most importantly, if we are going to frame menopause as a catastrophe, 
we need to think hard about the message we're sending to younger women who will inevitably face their own menopause. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. I mean, Martha isn't with us at the moment, but she may join us uh, during the session. Um, she's in Australia, so there's a time zone difference. Um, and a fascinating start to the conversation. Um, I'm struck with Martha's comment about hot fl hot flushes, no miracles, Susan. It's quite a quite a memorable yes. phrase. Well, and I saw a comment about have people done enough research? Surely there's more. Have you really looked at everything else? And I think we uh, we can be very confident Martha's in Martha's expertise. Um, but that's the classic, uh, along with vaginal atrophy. Those are the two classic symptoms that are not associated with everything else that's going on in your life and that when you do proper randomized control trials with placebos you can see what is actually getting better most people feel better if they're cared for if they take a pill that's even chalk um, a lot of people will feel better but mm. the the there's a dramatic you know 80 percent drop not even everyone gets their hot flushes uh, eradicated but i think the most important thing in the framing that she talked about was uh, with brilliant questions what is it? Is it a transition? We don't say that puberty is a disease where you move from one level of estrogen to another. We don't say pregnancy is a disease where you move from one level of estrogen to another. Um, and is the menopause a disease where you move to being absent and 100% of us therefore being diseased and ill, although some of us don't have symptoms? Or is it a withdrawal? And that makes it a really hard time. It's like being premenstrual for you know years. Um, because because withdrawing from any kind of uh, situation uh, can be very painful. And therefore, is the medical response like her, she describes can, in context and something to do with managing the time temporarily. Yeah. OK, well, I think we're going to get into some of these issues uh, a little later uh, during our conversation today. But I, Charlotte, uh, the BMJ's editorial scholar, is monitoring uh, the comments you've left. Hi, Charlotte. Um, and people have been uh, telling us what's best and worst about the menopause. What any any themes emerging from that? Yeah, definitely. So um, in terms of the worst things about the menopause, we've got lots of comments about the psychological effects. Um, lots of people talking about an increase in anxiety. Um, we've also got comments about an inability to think or feel like they can make logical connections between things, which has led to a um, kind of loss of confidence in abilities and then an effect on career. Um, also got comments about fatigue, joint pains and stiffness, um, temperature control, and then comments about feeling heard by doctors. Um, so the lack of confidence in GPs after kind of previous experiences. Um, and some comments about migraines and insomnia as well um so that's kind of all things under the worst yeah i mean it's not it's not i mean i wouldn't describe it as a scientific study but susan um, many of those see, themes seem familiar um absolutely and i'm fascinated but that um, martha said what are we telling young women that charlotte's told us the worst when the question was first of all what's the best <laughs> so maybe we could hear that other side of it please charlotte yes definitely um and there were lots of really um nice comments about the best things the theme of empowerment came out a few times which is is nice to see um end of monthly periods and no more need for sanitary products um and less need for contraception as well um also comments around like trusting yourself more and feeling more experienced and an increased feeling of community and support from fellow women as we kind of discuss this topic um Okay, I mean, I mean, Susan, are we in danger, before we go to our next speaker and final question for you, are we in danger of, in some ways, underplaying the issues women are facing? Um, well, as Martha said, there's a huge range from no symptoms that some people find extraordinary to very severe debilitating symptoms that interfere with work and daily life. Um, mm. So I, when you've got something very diverse, it's it's hard to say, are you overdoing it or underdoing it? Um, mm. uh, so I think we have to just bear that in mind all the time that it's individually experienced. Um, and it, is it, what is it? 
uh, then is our response. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Charlotte, for summarizing that. But do do keep those um, those comments coming. So we want to hear the best as well as the worst. And please do add more questions in the Q&A box for the panelists. Uh, so obviously Martha, uh, being on video, wasn't able to answer questions. But we do, our next Jillian is, and so Jillian will take uh, questions after she's spoken. So uh, Jillian Reeves is Professor of uh, Statistical Epidemiology and Director of Oxford University's Cancer Epidemiology Unit. Welcome, Gillian just appeared on Thank the screen. Uh, and so who better to take us through uh, the menopause, menopause home, hormone therapy trials and discuss the populations involved, the outcomes and the known unknowns of the research base um, and the evidence base. So thanks, Gillian. Um, Thank you. Well, Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak today. Um, I'll just try and uh, share my slides and hopefully you'll be able to see them. Uh, just uh, trying to get to the full screen. Um, um, okay, got it. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, yeah, just as sort of by way of introduction, um, what I've been asked to do today really is to give a kind of overview of the evidence of uh, the effects of HRT, not on menopausal symptoms, which as Martha says, you know, they've been shown to be very um, effective for, but more about the other possible risks and benefits of, of HRT. And obviously this is, is quite a hot topic at the moment. And you know, you can barely open the papers each day without reading about something else that's been associated with um, HRT use. And I should preface this by saying that this is not intended to be um, in any way, a definitive overview, uh, systematic in any way, but really just in, in sort of keeping with the, the knowns, unknowns um, theme, just really looking at, at what the main evidence is for some of these associations and highlighting, you know, the areas where we have pretty consistent, strong evidence. And on the other hand, you know, areas where actually there's, there's a lack of consensus or, or even just a lack of data full stop. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have any nice photos of, of postmenopausal women or, or witty uh, captions. I just, you know, all I can offer you is data. Um, so to start with, I've sort of ordered these, I suppose, in order of increasing uncertainty. So um, I'm starting with uh, breast cancer, which I think is one of the endpoints that we really have the most information on. And, and this graph here shows in black um, data from a very uh, relatively recent reanalysis of the worldwide evidence from observational studies, at least, on the risk of breast cancer associated with HRT use. Um, and as you can see, if you look here, this is the relative risk in women who are taking estrogen only and in women taking combined um, HRT relative to never users. And I think you can see here that, you know, in current users, there's a very smooth and very definite increase in breast cancer risk with increasing duration, uh, similarly for users of combined therapies. But also once women stop taking HRT, although this risk um, decreases somewhat, there is some excess risk which persists for many years. And at the moment, we know for at least 10 years after stopping, there's some excess risk. And, and these figures in red here, which I've overlain here, are really the data from the clinical trials from the Women's Health Initiative. And I think you can see here that actually they're broadly similar to what we see from, from the observational data. Um, certainly for combined preparations, you can see there's a significant increase from the trial data. Slightly um, more discrepant findings for estrogen only from the trials. They found a, a non-significant decrease in risk. Um, and it's not clear, you know, whether that's just due to chance or, or whether that's driven by something else. But I think overall, the data is, is actually quite compelling for an adverse effect of HRT on breast cancer risk. And obviously, because breast cancer is quite a common disease, um, these quite large relative risks in some cases do translate into, um, you know, in some cases, an appreciable number of, of extra breast cancers. So if you look at women, you know, between the ages of 50 and 70 who've taken HRT for 10 years, starting at age 50, 
Um, the estimates suggest that, you know, women who are taking estrogen only, there might be about one extra breast cancer per 100 users. But for women taking continuous combined preparations where progestogens are added each day, um, this goes up to about one in 25 users. Now, obviously, it's, you know, how you view these numbers is, is quite subjective, but those are our best estimates at the moment. So, you know, definitely, you know, I think the consensus is that there is an increased risk of breast cancer associated with HRT. Now, uh, HRT also increases the risk of other female cancers, particularly endometrial cancer for estrogen only therapy and, and for both types for ovarian cancer. Um, however, because these cancers are a lot rarer, the excess risks associated with HRT for them are, are somewhat lower. Um, and this bar chart here just really shows um, five-year incidence rates per thousand women according to HRT use um, split by each of these different types of female cancers. Um, so these are the numbers here for never users, for users of estrogen-only therapy, and lastly, for users of combined preparations. And you can see that you know, estrogen only is certainly worse for, for endometrial cancer. Um, it, it, it carries a, a bigger risk of endometrial cancer. But actually, in terms of total um, female cancers, actually, the, the biggest excess risk is definitely with use of combined preparations. So, so that's the, the evidence on female cancers. Now, turning to one of the, the benefits of HRT, um, and this is in, this is really clear for, for fracture risk. There is a clear benefit. Um, and in fact, HRT was first line therapy for osteoporosis um, until, you know, the adverse effects on, on breast cancer risk became apparent. And you can see here, this is data taken from our own million women study. While women are, are taking HRT, they have quite a big reduction in fracture risk overall. This is about a 40 percent reduction. Um, unfortunately, once they stop taking it, this benefit really disappears quite quickly. And, you know, you can see here, it suggests that even within a year of stopping use, their risk goes back to that of someone who had never taken HRT. And we also have quite good um, clinical trial evidence on this um, from the women, Women's Health Initiative. And they find very similar results in that if you look in the intervention phase, for both the estrogen only and the combined HRT trials, they see very similar reductions while women are taking HRT. But in the analyses of women, oops, sorry, in the analyses of women after they stop taking it, again, there's evidence that this, this benefit quickly disappears um, or largely disappears. So what this says is that, you know, HRT does protect against fractures. It's very good at protecting against fractures, but the effect is very transient. And so you know, what people I think often overlook is that, you know, taking HRT in your 50s for sort of five, 10 years, you know, you're not going to get lasting benefit from fractures from taking that. And it's certainly not going to protect you in your 70s unless you take, you know, carry on taking HRT, which, of course, would incur, you know, additional breast cancer and possibly other risks. So that's the main benefit for, for fracture risk. Now, in terms of... Um, cardiovascular disease, which is, uh, you know, getting into the more contentious area now. And this is the, the outcome that was really, you know, that the Women's Health Initiative trials were set up to address. Um, and you can see from this graph here, this shows the, the results of the, the WHI trials, that the black shows the results for the intervention phase, you know, um, what, when the trial was stopped, um, shortly after we would stop taking it. And the red lines here are the, the cumulative follow up. So the longer term findings. And you can see that for stroke, for, for any type of HRT, there was a clear and significant increase in risk. And in fact, this is why the, the estrogen only arm of this trial was, was eventually stopped. Um, but for coronary heart disease, which was actually thought to be prevented by, by HRT, there was actually no evidence for a risk or, or a benefit. And actually, had, had we stopped there and never done any more analyses on this data, I think the conclusion would be, you know, increases stroke and VTE, but actually doesn't really have an effect on coronary heart disease. Of course, that's not what happened. And these data have been poured over for, for many years since those trials stopped. And actually, one of the subgroup analyses that has received a lot of attention is this one here, looking at estrogen-only use and coronary heart disease by age at randomization. 
And that's because when they did this analysis, they found this very borderline uh, significant reduction in risk in women who had been randomized in their 50s. Um, and this was seen by, by many people as evidence for this kind of critical window of opportunity hypothesis, which kind of says that, you know, in order to get the benefits for coronary heart disease, you really have to start taking HRT almost as soon as, as the menopause hits. And taking it later is, is, you know, has no beneficial effect and actually um, might increase risk. Um, However, you know, when the, the trialists looked at this question specifically and they went back and looked at the results according to the interval between menopause and starting to take HRT, they actually found no evidence of any, any difference in effect. Um, and if you look at the observational data, they generally seem to show a small to maybe a 20 percent reduction in coronary heart disease in, in users of HRT. But of course, it's very difficult to assess how, how those results have been impacted by confounding, because we know that HRT users may differ in terms of socio-demographic, um, certain risk, you know, behavioral risk factors. And it's not clear whether those observational results are really very reliable for, for coronary heart disease. So at the moment, you know, you know, the feelings are quite polarized in, in this respect, because some people think of this as, you know, real evidence. that If you take it soon enough, you'll protect against coronary heart disease, whereas others think of this as just a sort of, you know, chance finding from a, a post hoc subgroup analysis. Okay. So the, the last outcome that I want to talk about is dementia risk. And this is really something that's, that's been in the news recently. And um, you know, my feeling is that there, there seems to be a sense that, that HRT uh, reduces your risk of, of cognitive decline or, or indeed dementia. And actually, if you look at the main randomized you know, clinical trial evidence for this, if anything, it seems to suggest um, a somewhat opposite effect. And this is data from the um, Women's Health Study, the, the memory um, arm of the study. And when they looked at this, they saw that if you look at probable dementia, there's a non-significant increase for estrogen only users, but um, a significant twofold increase in risk for combined HRT users, albeit based on quite small numbers. And when they looked at this composite measure, they also found uh, significant increases across both types of HRT. And so if you look at this, you, you might think, well, actually, this suggests there may be an increase in dementia risk, um, although it has to be said these are pretty small numbers. Now, if you look at the observational data for, for the association of HRT and dementia, um, it's actually quite um, inconsistent. Some studies find a decrease in risk, other studies find an increase. Um, but actually, this study here, which is probably one of the, the best studies, which used a, a primary care database and looked at pre prescription records um, and then followed women up to see um, what their risk of all dementia and Alzheimer's disease was. And actually, you know, there's nothing here to suggest anything like the twofold risks that the WHI trial found. Um, and actually, if anything, probably, you know, the, the sort of take home message from this oops, take home message here is that there is uh, weak evidence of a very small increased risk of Alzheimer's in long duration users of combined HRT. So, again, you know, there, there does seem to be a bit of a mismatch between perhaps what the 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 sort of public you know, perception is of the risks of dementia associated with HRT. Um, and lastly, this is this is just my attempt, if you like, a, a sort of schematic of where where I think we currently are with many of these endpoints in terms of the strength of the evidence that we have. And so on the left hand side, we've got the sort of the green circles, which are outcomes where I think there is quite clear and, and robust evidence of a benefit of HRT. And on the right hand side in red, um, those outcomes where, you know, there's, there's pretty good evidence for an increase in risk. And then for everything else, you know, in the middle, I would say that the, you know, it looks as if there's either no effect or there's still a lot of uncertainty. And certainly I would say that dementia and possibly coronary heart disease fall into this. And I've also put in this box, actually, the question about more contemporary constituents for HRT. There's a lot of interest in at the moment in um, what, what are called micronized progestogens or micronized progesterone, rather. And this is a, a sort of a newer form of progestogens, which has been 
um, sort of cited as possibly being um, less problematic in terms of some of the adverse effects of HRT. But the problem is because it's it's only recently become commonly used, um, that evidence hasn't really filtered through to the, the, the published data yet. So at the moment, we really don't know whether um, these types of constituents are going to have a greater or, or, or lesser effect. It's really um, very much an unknown. OK, so happy to take any questions. Thank you. Could you um, stop sharing your slides? Mm. Right, thank you. Uh, I mean, that, that was that was fascinating <laughs> uh, to see the evidence laid out in that way, because I mean, the first um, talk from Martha and, and the conclusion, um, broad, broad one, was that we need to take look at everybody on an individual basis. And then when you think you overlay that with this rather mixed picture about um, the, the impact of, of taking um, hormone replacement therapy um it, it gets a little confusing i mean what mm. you 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 spoke about heart let's take heart disease as an example where you said there's a subgroup analysis i mean as we, we know subgroup analyses are hypothesis generating uh, if anything mm. um mm -hmm. what, what's being done to try and settle that particular question or tell but understanding of that one well, it's, it's a real dilemma, actually, because um, the problem is, is that we have, you know, what, what we normally think of as the gold standard of evidence, which is randomized trials. And we've got randomized trial data, but really it was set up to look at overall coronary heart disease. Um, and also that the, the makeup of the women that took part in those clinical trials is, is really quite different from the women that would normally be, be receiving HRT for menopausal symptoms. Most of the women in the trials were in their sort of 60s and 70s. Um, and, you know, so they're, they're not really representative of the group that, that will be receiving HRT for menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so many people feel that that actually it's not the, the best population to, to test this hypothesis in. And you're right, it is, it is a new hypothesis. You know, I don't think that this was an a priori hypothesis. Um, but, you know, is there any appetite for, for another trial? I mean, you know, the, mini, the Women's Health Initiative co cost billions of pounds. Yeah. And I'm not sure that, that there, there is the sort of appetite to, to do another randomised trial. So I think probably the best thing in the circumstances is actually we, we need more judicious analyses of large observational studies. We need, you know, people to look carefully at the evidence for confounding is um, to see, you know, how much of an effect that's likely to have on, on their results. OK, I mean, presumably that there is a better opportunity with that now with, you know, now that we're using large data sets much more mm -hmm. uh, you know, readily, if not easily. Mm -hmm. Um, Susan, what reflections from you on uh, on, on what Julian just? Um, I was very interested to know whether the um, WHI trial uh, led to a drop in prescriptions and whether that had an impact on breast <clears throat> cancer, dementia, and heart disease in in a in a sort of experimental way. And also, people are asking a lot of specific questions uh, around: Does it make a difference if you start earlier and later, oral and? Um, patches and so forth and mm. we'd like to comment on that a bit generally although yeah. the time is limited yeah I mean I think that's an interesting question about you know that there was a huge drop in in HRT use following the publication of the the WHI trial results and the million women study results they came in you know, like a year apart and actually HRT use fell from about 30 percent down to about 15 percent over the course of you know two or three years and actually, that gave the opportunity for some very interesting ecological studies um, because it was a really sudden drop and there was no, you know, no other you know, possible reason for it. Um, and actually, there were a number of studies from various parts of the world which looked at routine data and actually picked up on a decrease in breast cancer incidence in the, rele in the relevant age groups and in the, you know, particularly for ER positive breast cancer, which we know is, is most affected. So... So I think the short answer to that is yes, that, you know, people have detected um, possible relevant decreases in, in risk. In terms of the, the difference in effect between the sort of mode of delivery, oral versus um, transdermal, the, the, it didn't seem to make much of a difference in terms of the breast cancer risk. But there is quite a, a lot of evidence from observational studies to show that it may well make a difference for stroke risk. And in fact, um, it looks as if the, the main sort of risk, associated risk for stroke is with use of, of HRT containing oral 
um, estrogens um, and that the risks are much lower and possibly, you know, not significantly raised for transdermal preparations. So, yeah, that is an interesting point. And that is one of the few cases where we see a difference depending on um, mode of delivery. Thank you. Thanks, Jillian. I mean, Susan, you were making the point. I mean, you, you're watching, uh, observing the questions people are asking uh, in, in chat. I mean, some of these are already answerable uh, by a nice guidance. Is that correct? Yes, I would very, I would very strongly recommend people went and had a look at that because it's very balanced. It looks at randomized and non-randomized uh, work and it gives numbers. It doesn't answer every specific question. Uh, but a lot of it is in there and it's a trustworthy source of information. I think that's one of the problems is, uh, you know, who's telling me this and what are their biases? Um, and that's why the natural experiment looked very uh, strong around the breast cancer. But of course, people are interested in my symptoms now and what about strokes and dementia later? So mm -hmm. I, I think there are things to be answered. But sometimes people are looking for excuses not to take it and sometimes people are looking for excuses to take it and then all we do is get upset <laughs> yeah yeah okay what 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 other questions are emerging in the in the q a charlotte um great thanks Brilliant specifically um so we've got a question saying are there studies showing that hrt reduced the risk of dementia cardiovascular disease and general effects of aging even in women without previous menopausal symptoms? Okay, so in most of the observational studies, we don't really know exactly why women are taking HRT. We don't know, for, you know, we don't know the severity of their symptoms. We just know that they're taking HRT. So it's not clear exactly, you know, whether these are women who've got severe symptoms or not. Um, you know, are there studies showing decreases in risk? Yes, there probably are. You know, there are observational studies which, you know, which show decreases in risk of coronary heart disease, for example, and, and dementia. Um, but the problem is that there are also studies showing an increase in risk. And, you know, it's that lack of consistency that I think makes it very difficult to be able to say, you know, actually, you know, is this something that should be given for, for prevention rather than treatment of symptoms? Because, you know, if you're going to give something for prevention, then you have to be, you know, quite clear about what the likely, you know, risks and benefits are going to be. And I think for coronary heart disease in particular, it's really unclear at the moment because of this apparent mismatch between the trial data and, and the observational studies. Thank you. Uh, any more, Charlotte? Virginia. Yeah, um, so we've got a question about um, how long is it safe to take HRT after surgical menopause? Could it be age unlimited? And if so, what to look for as a possible risk? Well, this is one of the special groups that, that Martha alluded to. And actually, you know, obviously women who have a, a surgical menopause tend, you know, are a subgroup and, and they use, usually have a surgical menopause, obviously a bit earlier. Um, so there's less data specifically about them. Um, but, you know, certainly in terms of the breast cancer risk, what we see is that in relative terms, the effect of taking HRT after, say, an early surgical menopause is very similar to, to you know, somebody taking it after a natural menopause at age 50. The only difference is that those women who have an early surgical menopause will be at a lower risk of breast cancer to start with by virtue of their early menopause. So, you know, you could say that, you know, the excess risk that they'll be experiencing will, will be less. Um, is, you know, it's a difficult question to say, you know, how long is it safe to take for, you know, it will, your risk of, of breast cancer and some of these other outcomes will increase with increasing duration of use. Um, and so there's no sort of safe, non-safe threshold. I think it's it's more about trying to look at, as you say, the nice guidance and the and the numbers of cases that it's likely to incur and just trying to, to assess whether, you know, for, on an individual basis, whether that's a risk that, that the woman is, is comfortable with. Great, thank you. Um, you're doing a great job of summarising the evidence. It's all very complicated. <laughs> uh, Charlotte, one more then. Is there another one? Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a couple. Um, so okay. this one um, was a question echoed by a few people, which is, why did you not include the E3N cohort study in the paper? Does it not fulfil all the inclusion criteria? Yeah, okay, no. Well, it's it, not a specific it, question, but yes, over to you. 
<laughs> so, so the E for those of you who don't know, the E3N cohort is a very large cohort study um, from France. And, and this question is particularly relevant because you know, use of micronized progesterone has been much more common in, in France than, than in other countries. So it's where most of the evidence on micronized progesterone comes from. And, and actually, we did include um, E3N in the, in the meta-analysis. Um, but the problem was that, you know, that they had further follow-up data that had not been contributed to the meta-analysis by the time we published. So we have some of their data included in the meta-analysis, but we don't have all of their data. And we certainly didn't have all of the cases that they published on subsequently. Um, so they, they have published subsequently on, they probably have the biggest data set on micronized progesterone. And, and some of the findings are interesting, but it's still relatively small numbers of, of cases compared to the information level that we have for, for those other commonly used um, preparations. And that's why I, I'm still, you know, being a bit cautious about how much you can interpret that, that information as saying that these definitely have a, a different effect to other sort of older preparations. I think with the best main message is there's a trade off. If you have an early menopause, you get some more diseases. If you have a late one, you get some more disease. If you have more periods and more or less children, uh, you have more risks and the same the other way around. And it sounds like we can't we can't win it all there. We're going to have uh, benefits and harms, whatever the decisions. So difficult trade offs, but good information in the nice guideline, which is there. But we're now running a little behind for Cambridge. I know you don't want to no, do it. We'll miraculously, you know, I hope still finish well in time, Susan, don't worry. But I think it's a really helpful conversation because it's um, you know, contextualizing the problems faced in that conversation between a clinician and somebody seeking best advice. And how do you how do you decide on those trade-offs? Charlotte, have, have, was, have, we, have we got more questions for Gillian or are they, well, Gillian's not there now. So uh, we'll ask her, oh, she's come back. Did you have one more? You said. Yeah, we can do one more. Um, no, the last one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so is the risk of breast cancer higher for women whose mothers or sisters have had breast cancer post menopause? You've got on mute, Gillian. Yeah, no, I'm saying that that's a very good question, actually. And uh, when we when we looked in the meta analysis, we we did look at the consistency of the the results for breast cancer across all sorts of characteristics of women. And actually, for the most part, and including when we looked at women with and without a family history, we saw that the relative increase in breast cancer risk was was pretty much the same. Um, of course, because women with a family history of breast cancer starting out at a higher background risk, it does mean that, you know, that that extra breast cancer risk is going to translate into a slightly higher you know, number of extra breast cancers because, you know, you're multiplying that relative risk by a, a higher background risk. Um, but in terms of the pattern of risk, it, it's very similar. OK, thank you, Gillian. We'll give you a break. We'll see you at the end for the for the panel questions. Charlotte, thank you. Um, and, and thanks, Susan. Right. Let's go to our next speaker, who is Claire Hardy. Claire is a senior lecturer in organisational health and well-being at Lancaster University, where she conducts research into several areas of work um, uh, in psychology, including menopause and premenstrual experiences, investigating intervention development. Uh, so Claire's here. Hello, Claire. Welcome. Uh, Claire's here to summarise what we know and don't know about supporting women in the workplace, which has already been mentioned. So Claire. Hello. Um, can you see my screen yet? I think there was a delay when we tested it. We can see it. Oh, wonderful, Perfect. wonderful news. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to take a bit of a shift um, to look at the context of the workplace. So for my uh, presentation, what I'm going to do is just briefly share with you just some of the published um, peer reviewed research evidence on interventions that have been conducted within the context of work on female employees and their menopausal symptoms, for example. It's, it's an aspect of the menopause that you know, it doesn't get as much attention in research than other aspects like HRT. Um, 
Uh, I think it should, but I'm biased in, in that view. Uh, but anyway, hopefully this presentation will just make some of the existing evidence more known to people who are on the call. And um, if I have time at the end, if we're not going to be too strict with times, I'd like to kind of touch on just some of the unknowns that I think we should really consider with menopause and work. Okay, so, you know, just why is menopause in the workplace, uh, you know, important? So kind of Martha touched on this, but, you know, we have a lot of female employees employed um, in the UK, approximately around about 5.2 million at the moment, or in around about the age when, you know, they may be experiencing menopausal symptoms and going through their menopausal transition. And whilst for some that's absolutely no problem at all, for others it can be quite difficult. Um, potentially, you know, maybe up to half um, of menopausal working women may be experiencing difficult symptoms um, at work. Um, now, a lot of this data is kind of pre-COVID data, um, which is one of the unknowns. Um, we definitely need to think about the workplace moving after COVID because things have changed so rapidly. Um, but, you know, some of the difficulties that women often talk about, things like, you know, concentration problems, fatigue, mood, um, irritability, the hot flushes, as well as the physical aches and pains. And not surprisingly, women are concerned about going through their menopause and how that might affect their performance at work, how it might affect their career, how are they going to balance work life when they've got symptoms to manage on top of that as well. Um, and something that is quite, you know, always strikes me um, and kind of, you know, really wants me to get to grips with this is just that there seems to be a lack of conversation about this in the workplace. Um, and women often said they don't feel able to disclose their menopause or if they're having any difficulties with their menopause to their line managers, to their workplaces, you know, maybe just to ask for some some help and support. And from the research, some of the reasons that, that women give for that often relate to the, the organisational context and factors related to the workplace. So who is their line manager? Are they male? Um, you know, do they work in a male dominated environment that makes it quite difficult for women to feel like they can speak up? You know, what kind of relationships do they have with their managers and with colleagues that, you know, maybe affect whether or not they feel they can have that kind of personal conversation? Because there's that fear of a of not getting a, a helpful or positive response. There's that fear of a, of a possibly a stigmatizing view that people might have um, about going through the menopause or their age. And women can find it embarrassing to talk about and feel that if they raise it to a line manager, they might feel embarrassed to talk about this topic. So they kind of avoid it. Um, and some women say in some of the, the research and the interviews we've done, you know, they just feel like it wouldn't be considered a valid reason um, to ask for any help or support at work and they feel like they just have to get on with it um, and not ask for any help which to me it just it just doesn't it doesn't seem right um, particularly as when you explore what it is that women say that they want you know these things here they're not they're not big asks you know they're, they're quite minor things that can be provided um, and adjustments can be made for but, you know, we just seem to be a long way off where we, we where we need to be. Now, in terms of workplace interventions, um, what do we know about them? What things have been done in the, in the evidence? Um, well, well, actually, very little. So when you look at the published studies um, from peer reviewed journals on workplace interventions and the menopause, there are five published studies in this area, three of which focus specifically on kind of looking at the menopausal symptoms and experiences in female employees. And I'm just going to try and go through very quickly um, these kind of different interventions, um, just so you've got an idea of the kind of things that are being offered and that are being tested. So the first one here is a, an intervention that comes from over Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and it's the Work Life Program. Um, now, this is an intervention that was carried out with female workers, whereby they quite consistently, um, consistently, quite simply, um, what they did was they they had three kind of main components of their interventions. So they had eight one hour sessions um, with these workers where they had menopause consultation, they had a work life 
coaching sessions, they had physical training sessions that happened kind of simultaneously. And then they had another menopause consultation as well. And those sessions kind of spanned out over a couple of months. And what they were interested in was to find out, you know, is there any impact of this particular program on women's health and work functioning? So they looked at menopausal symptoms, work functioning, quality of life, uh, workability. And what they found is that um, um, post results compared to pre results, that there were improvements in menopausal symptoms and workability. And from some qualitative interviews that they did with some of their participants, they found a number of other positive changes too around behavior. So women were more likely to take rest, um, physical health and mental well being. So women in the interview said that they had reduced symptoms and they also felt less stressed. And then in the workplace, um, the interviews were suggesting that. Women said that after the intervention, you know, they were just managing their workload a bit better and they were just more open to talking about the menopause. So that is the first kind of intervention. They're looking at female workers and giving them information and help on their menopause. But then we have another intervention, which is much more focused on the impact of meditation on insomnia and menopausal symptoms in working menopausal women. And this comes from us from Brazil. And they did a, a randomized control trial um, where they had one group of clerical workers in this study that took part in an eight week intervention where they were required to do daily 45 minute meditation. Uh, they were also given some sleep hygiene guidelines as well to follow through this eight week period. And then they had a control group as well who were just given the sleep hygiene guidelines. And so they were interested to see whether or not there were any improvements kind of pre post and were there any differences in the groups. And what they found in this study is that actually both groups experienced some improvements um, in insomnia. The control group showed improvement in their sleep quality. Um, those who'd done the meditation, they had improvements in their menopausal symptoms too. And that was significantly better compared to the control group too. So that was another kind of interesting study, very much focused on the kind of sleep aspects to do with the menopause in these workers. Now, the next study that I'm going to talk about, it's a study myself and colleagues have done, um, and this was much more focused on workers who were experiencing problematic basal motor symptoms, so problematic hot flushes and night sweats. And what we did in this study, we did a randomized control trial where we invited menopausal employees um, in the UK to take part in an intervention study where we randomly allocated women to the intervention group, which was a self help booklet giving a four week program using the cognitive behavior therapy approach. Um, and then the other group, the control group, they didn't receive anything, but they were offered the self help booklet after the research study. So we were interested to see, you know, are there any differences in these two groups? You know, does this self-help booklet seem to make any difference on how problematic these hot flushes are experienced, the frequency of symptoms, as well as a number of other kind of health um, uh, outcomes and work outcomes as well. It's quite a big study. And very you know, quickly, briefly, what we found in this particular trial is compared to the control group, those that had actually followed the four week CBT self-help program did show significant improvements in their problematic ratings, as well as the frequency. They had lower frequency of symptoms. And then there were other benefits um, that we show, uh, found as well, improved work, social adjustments, sleep better, menopause beliefs, um, beliefs and behaviors around the hot flushes and the night sweats, um, some well-being and somatic symptom improvement as well. That was a bit later with a 20 week follow up time period. But then also what we found quite interesting was that presenteeism seemed to improve in those that had been part of the self-help um, arm of the, the study. So presenteeism related to menopause is when somebody can be at work and perform at work in spite of having menopause or difficult menopausal symptoms. So that seemed to be better. Women felt like they were still able to perform in spite of their menopause. So. We thought that was you know, quite an exciting um, result simply because, you know, a lot of the kind of issues that are raised with using CBT um, to help women who may be having 
difficult symptoms is is something around like accessibility so you know how do you find a therapist there are not enough therapists to go around for everybody well what we found in this particular study is that actually a self-help approach can work too so that was that was pretty exciting um the now those studies, they were the ones that were focusing really on menopausal symptoms and experiences. What this study and the next study that I'll show you did is they were focused on interventions to try and look at menopause knowledge and attitudes. So for this particular intervention here, they tested whether a three hour health education session uh, with female teachers in Eritrea um, could make any difference to their uh, self-perceived menopause knowledge and attitude towards the menopause. And, you know, the session, uh, three hours, it was some lectures, they had some group discussions, they had handouts. Um, and so they compared it kind of pre-post and what they found is that following up after the um, teachers had been involved in the education session that their menopause knowledge and attitude towards the menopause had had significantly improved um, so that was pretty good um, and lastly this is quite a different as well so this particular study um, it was conducted by myself and colleagues, um, we turned our attention to um, line managers. So something that, you know, working menopausal women say is quite, a, you know, a challenge, particularly when they're having difficulties or maybe they don't want to disclose their menopause. You know, line managers play a key role in getting the help and support to workers. So what we wanted to do is to see whether or not we might be able to improve um, the knowledge and attitudes of line managers by using a very brief 30 minute online training program. Um, so we recruited line managers in the UK to take part. Um, we tested them pre post um, them taking part in the online training. And, um, and what we found is that even in this 30 minute online training program, which contained a number of kind of small videos, um, some role plays with actors and some interviews with line managers and menopausal women, had a quiz and things. Um, that short kind of brief intervention actually showed that um, there were significant improvements in menopause related knowledge, um, line managers attitudes towards menopause. So specifically, you know, they didn't see the menopause as an embarrassing topic topic to talk about at work. Um, also their confidence in talking about the menopause at work improved and their intentions to talk about menopause in the work co context improved as well. So, so that was really good and that was really promising from our perspective. Um, and you know there are not many studies there. There are some and they are very promising um, and I think what's quite interesting uh, particularly with what we've been talking about so far, is that the particular interventions focused at female workers and their menopausal symptoms, none of the interventions in the work context used any hormones or any drugs at all, but they still showed some positive results for working menopausal women and their symptoms. Um, now, of course, these studies have limitations to them. Um, it's, it's actually very challenging to do research in the context of the workplace. Um, but nevertheless, I think we do have to persevere with it because we, we really, really do need to address the, the lack of research that's been done on this area. We need to repeat these studies for sure and address some of the limitations that these, um, that these studies have. But hopefully I have some time just to kind of reflect on some of the unknowns that I think are quite interesting to think about and to reflect upon. Um, I mean, there are so many. There are so, so many because this is just, it seems like it's such an, it's in its infancy stage, this whole area. Um, but some of the things I think would be useful to think about is, you know, just who these target populations are. So, Typically in these intervention studies, um, they're generally women who are going through a kind of typical age of menopause or mid-age. Um, but you know, as we as we just heard, you know, there are people who go through early menopause as well. Um, you know, we don't we don't know if 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 interventions might work for them. Um, you know, we have a lot more workers now who are coming into the workplace with um, disabilities. Is there anything for them? You know, has it been evaluated? Does it work? 
don't know. You know, there are lots of things kind of happening if you look online, if you look on the media, there's loads of trainings on offer for workplaces. There are, you know, expert consultants offering services and training and things. But, you know, we we don't know if they work. We, we don't know if they're effective. Um, and I, I would love it if we could share all the evidence that perhaps the, these other people have, because I think it would be wonderful to try and bring it all together to try and understand what's going on. Um, but something I think that is particularly interesting to reflect on is the potential focus that might be drawn. Um, uh, some people might draw the conclusion that there's a focus on the employee and their symptoms and helping the employee and their symptoms kind of versus the organization. So is it that it's the responsibility of the employee to manage their symptoms and that's all that matters? It's, it's up to them. Or is it that the workplace has a role to play as well? And, you know, we sometimes again hear in the media that menopause causes women to leave work. Um, but I think the question is, is it the menopause or is it an unsupportive workplace? Um, to me, I think I think I think it's both. I think both have a role to play, both the person and the organisation. I think we both have a, a role to play. But, you know, we need to investigate that. We need to have a look at that. Um, and there are just so many other questions to think about as well. So do knowledgeable managers actually lead to improvements for menopausal workers and their menopausal experience? don't know. Does having workplace menopause policies actually make any difference to workers going through their menopause? Don't know. We don't know yet. There are so many questions that we, we, we still have to answer. And I think it's an exciting time, um, but I think it's a really important time for research. I, I hope funders hear of it and want to kind of really start making more of, of attention to this and putting in resources to it, because I think the given the amount of women who are working during their menopause and potentially the numbers that may be having difficulties, I think we really do need to keep carrying on doing as high quality research as we possibly can to develop and evaluate workplace interventions to help women and hopefully in turn it will help us all. So I'm going to end it there. I've probably gone way over so I apologise if I have. Claire, thank you. No, you I mean we were running late, so it's not it's not it's not you that's late. It's me. Um, can you uh, stop sharing, please? Of course. Thank you. That was really interesting. I mean, you said it actually before I said it, which is that the evidence base seems pretty preliminary at the moment. I mean, some of those interventions you mentioned, interesting as they are, um, in terms of trying to interpret them. Uh, I mean, either they didn't have a control group or some of the control groups yep. weren't adequate enough really to draw much of a conclusion but it's good mm. that that thinking is taking place and I suppose your challenge is really who's responsible you know, who who can contribute to making women's working lives better in this regard um, and surely I would have thought employers do have a place. Uh, Susan any any reflections from you? Um, I think it was very cheering to hear that there might be tools that we eventually can uh, get hold of that will help us whether it's work or not to sleep better um, uh, which will help us function in every single way. Um, I, I do have a sense of, well, the employers will see if you turn up to work, that's better. So there's an incentive there for them. The worry is whether someone's been picked on. I'd be very interested to know, are there objective measures of performance? For example, a peak in disciplinaries um, uh, around the, the early 50s. And, and is there a difference in performance between men and women we see at other parts of comparisons of the, the, the workforce because it, it would be worrying if everything was pointed to you you're the problem as opposed to the world isn't supportive as you were saying um, mm. but I, I, I was very encouraged by the idea that there are going to be tools that we can have in our hands and in our employers hands in the future fingers crossed good so Claire are you able to answer Susan's question about I, I'm guessing you might not be <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's such a good point. I mean, I, I didn't put, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this data that we have and the information we have is, is self-reported data. So, you know, women feel like, you know, their poor performance is going down, you know, they're not doing as well as they should. It's the 
their perception of themselves and not necessarily an objective measure of they're actually doing any worse you know we, we don't actually know if they're doing any worse in their job at all there's just there's no evidence to really kind of not enough evidence to say confidently that actually you know something's going on I suspect for some proportion there may be differences but for the vast majority I would say possibly not noticeable um but can we get a hold of the kind of objective data from organizations I mean they do collect they do collect that data I think the challenge is trying to disentangle it from other things so work stress we know work stress accounts for a huge amount of just well-being in general it accounts for work performance and other outcome measures too so trying to disentangle that from what is the menopause and what is just work stress life stress stress of you know go through this new phase of life it's it's very very challenging to do yeah and, and also given you know work generally is a male dominated environment i mean yeah. women for through no fault of their own you know might be uh, subject to more disciplinaries and being marked you know worse in their performance than than they should be you know because of the inherent discrimination uh, yeah. in institutions and organizations yeah. okay um and, and, Charlotte, let, 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 sorry do you want to, do you want to say something oh on i was that? just going to say it's getting access to that as well because yeah. or would organizations be happy to share that kind of data you know yeah. it's they should be shouldn't they i mean they um, should i know yeah. i yes I, I i agree yes we should be able to get it it's just it's quite it's quite challenging yeah okay Charlotte, we'll take one question for claire then just to try and you know, try and get closer to being on time then we can take any more in the panel conversation charlotte okay great um so with all these risks and benefits for medical treatments has there been any research which looks at the interaction of diet and or weight as well as other factors like lifestyle chronic conditions etc are you talking about in general or in the context of work um i think in work specifically um so some of the interventions here are kind of tapped into um, when they've been doing their, their information and education. They had information about what the menopause is, how they can manage it, things like that. And they provided kind of guidance and steering to, OK, the, these kind of suggestions might be quite good for you. Um, but there's only five studies in total on interventions and there's only kind of three. So it's, it's just really, really limited. Um, like I know there are things going on in practice, um, like people are doing these things in practice and offering their help and services like dietitians, nutritionists, physiotherapists, they're doing a lot of things I'm aware of. But what I'm not seeing is it kind of coming together to produce some kind of evidence that we can publish so that we can start building up that evidence base to then start helping to inform evidence informed practice. Um, so it's just very, very limited. Uh, so there was another the question. Wants... It, it probably is a bit difficult for you. Things like food and uh, other lifestyle in general. What um, I say, not as, you know, is that the usual things: being active, sleeping well, um, eating healthily, not smoking, not drinking too much. Yeah. Those, those yeah. are always good for everybody all the time. Okay, we know that. Um, but what the, I think you were talking particularly about an intervention that affected sleep, uh, which is very. Uh, wearing and I wondered somebody asked a question what is sleep hygiene and you might be able to answer that because you've, you've done research on it yeah absolutely yeah so for that particular intervention um they included I think it was around about 19 kind of criteria that they passed on it was based on some earlier research um I think published in 2019 um and it was just kind of general hints and tips like you know when you go to bed try and you know, try and keep the noise down, you know, look at your caffeine intake, look at your um, alcohol intake, um, you know, try to try to have a, a bed that's very comfortable, you know, keeping the temperature kind of, you know, those kinds of general things, not menopause specific, but just general how to create a good routine and environment to have a good night's sleep. So that particular study, that was the information that they provided, which is quite a bit because it's it's not a lot. It's just kind of use. It's just information, useful information. But I guess if you've never seen that information before and you're having sleep difficulties, you know, if you give it a try, right. it might just work. 
Claire, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll hear more from you in the panel discussion at the end. But thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, we're going to move now to Margaret McCartney, uh, who's our final speaker today. Margaret, uh, very familiar to BMJ readers. Uh, Margaret's a GP in Glasgow and a regular contributor still to our opinion section. It says here, Margaret's the scourge of commercial influences on healthcare. I think that's probably true, um, and that's why I've asked Margaret to come here and talk to us about the money that's affecting the debate around menopause care. Margaret, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Someone needs to let me share my screen. <laughs> we need to show Margaret now that she's here. <laughs> Definitely here. I'm trying to leave. Uh, Margaret, can you turn your video on? Yeah, I'm trying to start it and it wouldn't allow me to. Oh, weird. So it says that it's... Um, the host has stopped it. <laughs> so it's big BMG. Firing to, against uh, you. Trying to stop the truth here. There's no way we'd do that. There Not. we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there, you go. there you are. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Great. So here we go. So I'm um, GP in Glasgow, and um, I'm coming to talk to you about um, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, or um, as I think Susan has it right, um, menopause therapy, um, evidence and marketing. So here's my declaration of interest. I'm age 51 and female. Whether that is a declaration of interest, anyone should be concerned about, I don't know, but that's that's the truth. Um, and I'm a GP partner. So obviously what's happening in terms of HRT prescriptions affects me um, as my workload was going to vary according to it. So that's a probable conflict of interest there. I'm a CSO career um, fellowship um, academic at St Andrews University. I do freelance um, media and journalism. And my full declarations of interest are on who pays this doctor.org. So over the last couple of years, you can hardly um, escape the headlines. They have been absolutely everywhere. And um, we've been told that HRT is not a danger to women. Quite a definitive statement there. Um, NICE told the press that HRT could benefit one million women. The Economist have um, made the claim that um, more women should take hormone replacement therapy. And um, then we had the crises of HRT running out in various high street stores. And you'll see the graph in the middle there from um, the Nuffield Trust showing that extra pale blue line on top with the annual change, the extra HRT prescriptions that have been happening in the UK, it's been going up and up and up. And at the same time, we've had lots of claims saying that HRT has health benefits beyond the menopause. So it has barely been out of the press. And we know there's lots of evidence for lots of conditions that what happens in the media has an effect on what the decisions are around health that people choose and make. So big publicity for the all-party parliamentary group on menopause back in October, which I wrote about for the BMG. And I was really um, impressed by the amount of media coverage that this report got. And the conclusions um, from it were, um, were pretty stark, um, basically saying that despite the evidence and the safe and effective use of HRT to manage symptoms, misconceptions around its usage and the perceptions of the dangers strongly prevail amongst women and healthcare professionals. So really a pitch there to be getting more women to take it and more professionals to prescribe it. Um, they were um, advocating that screenings of women over a certain age, I'm certainly in that bracket, could help improve diagnosis and treatment of menopause at an earlier stage. So really that's a pitch for every um, woman in Britain to be um, have some kind of intervention with a healthcare professional, which she would be um, assessed for or offered um, therapy for something that she may or may not be having symptoms from. They also made the claim that um, the MHRA should evaluate the evidence for testosterone with a view of getting this essential treatment option licensed in the UK. Now, from my reading of things, I don't think these are neutral statements. I think these are statements that are very much on the side of more HRT is better HRT. Now, it might be, it might not be, but I can't help but notice the fact that this report was researched by DGA, who are a public relations company, and funded by Bristol Myers Squibb and Astellas Pharma. So my concern is that that fact was hardly reported, if at all, in the, wide, in the wide press coverage that this report received. And I think that's important information that I would like to have known in order to interpret what the recommendations of that report were making. 
So on the left, we've got what NICE say are the indications for HRT. And on the right, we've got what the British National Formula Lay via the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority have to say about the indications for HRT. So NICE um, quite plainly say vasomotor symptoms, psychological symptoms, altered sexual function and urogenital atrophy as indications for HRT. And in the BNF, um, it talks about the, um, and I'll just put down in particular, HRT does not prevent coronary artery disease or protect against the decline in cognitive function and it should not be prescribed for these purposes. Experience of treating women over 65 years with HRT is limited. So pretty clear statements there and also making quite clear that there are risks in association with HRT treatments. And it's really important if you're ever making a decision about a medical intervention to have good, open, transparent, fair information. And I think these are good examples of fair information. However, I spent a couple of hours this morning on Google and I Googled in private HRT and HRT wellbeing. And I, I, I found lots and lots of private um, clinics and um, lots of organisations offering HRT out with the NHS. And I looked at claims that were being made for treatment of, of um, menopause using HRT. And this is um, treatment of um, normal menopause rather than premature menopause. And these were the kinds of claims that I found that HRT was being offered to treat or improve on private um, organisation websites. So we've got wrinkled skin, dry skin, constipation, diarrhoea, indigestion, itchy skin and scalp, weight management. Um, it was being offered for glowing skin, thicker, glossier hair to live longer for premature aging and in order to help stop heart disease. And these were all on websites which could prescribe HRT. There was somebody attached to these websites with a prescription qualification. So just rewind, let's have a look and see what the evidence says about changes in quality of life with HRT. Now, I think there's very little, no dispute at all, that HRT really helps with vasomotor symptoms, hot flushes, night sweats and insomnia. Here's a good randomised control trial that randomised um, women with um, with women in normal in the menopausal age, so not premature menopause, um, to either HRT or placebo, published in the BMG. And you'll find really significant improvements for those top three symptoms. But look down the other ones, feeling depressed, feeling anxious, dizziness, aching joints or muscles, tiredness and headache. We really can't say with any degree of certainty that we can offer HRT as a treatment for those symptoms. And that's important information, I think, for women to know. And just of note, those clinics that I looked at that were offering HRT for all these other things, and you know, uh, you know, and I'm not saying all these clinics were, but certainly some of them were, were getting into the realms of menopause marketing. So you're a menopausal woman, you've come to us because you're not feeling good. Why don't you also consider vaginal tightening, aesthetics, but without looking done, a fat loss laser, treatment for the reduction of your cellulite, um, interventions in order to help you age more slowly, pretty amazing facial rejuvenation and thermocheck breast screening, which is really bunk. And all this stuff was being um, marketed through um, a kind of conduit of um, interventions that you could consider for your menopause. And I'm really concerned that what we're doing is we're making um, women aware of the menopause, but we're not actually giving women really good high quality information about the menopause so they can get help to sort out what actually would be helpful, what would be less helpful and what the potential risks and benefits might be. So as a reminder, this is what NICE says about managing menopausal symptoms with hormone replacement therapy. Right at the bottom, aim to prescribe the lowest dose for the shortest possible duration. What Susan said earlier, it stands true. And we know that's because there are hazards and side effects associated with HRT. Every woman is different, has to be an individual decision, but we should bear in mind that everything that we do in a medicine has got the potential for harm. Meantime, there's this wider narrative going on about menopause just now. Women are being offered um, over-the-counter blood tests to diagnose menopause earlier without being given good information about why that might not be hugely helpful or why blood tests might not be needed at all. And um, Women are being um, coming to their GPs, I think there's various... Um, uh, reviews and websites of their NHS GPs on private GP websites saying that I wanted to stay in it forever but my GP wouldn't let me I've had to fight with my GP to get it and I, I think this is really sad and really unfortunate because I, I think that most doctors want to do the right thing and I think that most doctors want to try and have rational discussions about what the pros and cons are and if the women are getting um, unfair unhelpful information from some sectors about benefits of HRT that aren't actually evidence-based that becomes a real problem 
It becomes a real problem because we go over promising of multiple interventions. That's not fair. And additionally, the real problem of diagnostic overshadowing. If you've got a list of hundreds of potential symptoms that could be caused by the menopause, but we're not sure that they actually are, we could easily, easily miss significant pathology amongst that. That's nothing to do with menopause at all. And as Claire pointed out earlier, um, there's lots of people offering workplace solutions for the menopause. This is very much like the resilience treatments or interventions offered so often by the NHS. Instead of fixing the actual problems, and we tell individuals to sort themselves out and take on responsibility for problems that they may not have um, total control over. The other concern that I have is the lack of truly independent information out there. Um, NICE has got links to patient information sites which have got direct or indirect direct links with pharmaceutical organisations. I don't really think that's good enough. I think we're aiming for in, independent information that we know is as least biased as possible. And I'm really concerned about this because I don't think we're good enough at sort of um, interrogating the evidence and interrogating claims that are being made. So this is on the NIHR website and um, it comes from a talk, I think, that Davina McCall, who I think is quite famous for having done various programmes about menopause. And she's quoted on the NHR website as saying that HRT um, is unbelievably good health benefits to it and particularly health of your bones. Yes, we agree about um, the 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 advantages while you're taking it. Um, but as has been explained earlier, that, that um, benefit does decline over time. It can help with heart health, brain fog and libido. Do we have evidence for the first two? There was a recent study connecting HRT to reducing the risk of Alzheimer's if you're prone to getting it. Well, that's a study down there that I've put a little screenshot from on the right. And I think we're very far from being able to say that HRT can prevent dementia. And as we equally heard earlier, um, the evidence about that when we look at it systemically is really not at all definitive. So in summary, what would help? These are my unknowns that are needing known. Um, I think we need independent and fair information. Would that help? I hope so, but we need to test it and prove it. I think we need transparency about the potential for conflicts of interest. And I think we need much more honesty about our uncertainties, especially symptomatology, quality of life scores, and the potential harms of HRT. I think we should also represent more diverse experiences of menopause. It's not all terrible. I am the fittest and the healthiest and the happiest I've ever been. And um, we should not assume that women are a pathology in need of a prescription, but equally we mustn't we must listen to women's voices who are telling us that they do need help as well. The key is to be honest about what we know and honest about what we don't know and make sure that we try and reduce our uncertainties with high quality research. Thank you very much. Margaret, thank you very much. Um, fascinating. So um, this is really a sell. I mean, that's what you're saying. I mean, to sell from uh, <laughs> my companies and clinicians who are making money out of uh, marketing HRT and, and saying it, all everybody, should, all women should be taking it. Yeah, I mean, it's you know some of the claims that we made on some websites are dreadful, they're appalling. I should really have been sitting with a, a notepad to make complaints to the Advertising Standards Authority about so many of them. You know, where is the regulation in this? You know, it is absolutely shocking. I mean, you consider that women are paying hundreds of pounds often for these private appointments, yet aren't being given good quality information. It's terrible. Now, I can understand why many women have lost faith in NHS GP. I have. It's impossible to do a good job in general practice. We are under so, so much pressure. It is appalling. But equally, in general practice in the NHS, you're unlikely to get offered something that is not based in evidence. I can't say the same for the private sector. Clearly, there are some very high quality private sector clinics, but also even from my two hour um, research on Google this morning, there are certainly multiple private clinics who are not of it offering evidence-based care and they're charging a fortune for it and that really worries me yeah thank you um so susan if we look at what we've heard uh, this afternoon we had martha telling us you know it's, it's indiv there's individualized risk i think that was what, what we discussed at the end of martha's uh uh talk then we talked then um after jill had spoken there was the whole issue of well you know it's a it's understanding the risk profile is quite complicated and so even then when you're talking to women on a one-to-one -one basis, it's quite hard to uh, to arrive at a particular decision in terms of whether or not to take HRT. Uh, and of course, Claire suggested other approaches that might be taken apart from uh, tablets and, and and hormone therapies. How do we how do we kind of stop this relentless march towards, which seems to be over medicalization? 
of the menopause? Uh, well, I wish we knew the answer to that because it's not the menopause alone that is over medicalized. I mean, no. for me, who went through a time, um, you know, in the 80s where all my bosses were being flown to Switzerland on skiing holidays by the menopause companies, uh, and the narrative was much stronger then, although it's reappeared, that all women are diseased, they have this thing called estrogen deficiency. Um, it's strange to see it come back. I suspect a lot of debates wax and wane, and this one will do the same. But right from the beginning, I think even we're talking about this framing of, is this a problem of low levels? Um, the answer is no, they're new levels, which are low, like children have low levels, and the symptoms pass. Some people, they don't get them. Some people, they're terrible. Some people, they pass after many, many years, but they mostly pass. So are we dealing with something which is a withdrawal, in which case we should call it menopause hormone therapy, something that helps you wind down and that you might take for a year or five years or taper or see if you can manage. Martha saying that half the symptoms returned when you stopped has that ring of dependence about it that's ever so slightly worrying. Or is this something where evolutionarily we were never supposed to live this long and really we could all do with a bit of estrogen to live longer but there is you know there is even an evolutionary hypothesis called the grandmother hypothesis which says actually it's a very good thing to have a menopause you stop having children you live to see your young children uh, to, to older age you support the younger women having children um and you're you're full of vim and vigor so um there's there's philosophical arguments about what is this thing? But it's definitely easy to disease monger. Um, and I think that uh, Margaret uh, rightly talked about uh, not just the labels, but the, the idea that all these are drugs. And what a drug is, is a poison from which we are trying to extract the benefit. And there is a clear benefit for many women who are suffering from estrogens and progesterones and all the, the, the various ways of doing it. But, you know, is this a is this poison one that is actually really good for us long term or not? So that that's what I take from it. And I would rather trust nice than the celebrities. But the celebrities are enormous influencers these days. Mm. And um, we have a very different relationship. It's not as deferential to our doctors. Um, but I think I think the people are not stupid. And, you know, we've just got to get much sassier about who's trustworthy uh, with guidance. And that means some regulation on, you know, what is good framing? If I do nothing, if I do something, how many people? 190, this sort of thing. Um, yeah. Difficult. Okay. You know, difficult. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, we'll pick up on those questions. I think uh, some of the in the panel discussion, I'm sure. And Charlotte, I'm sure you've got one or two questions for Margaret. Margaret, I've got one particular question for you, which is that I mean, you do a lot of work in competing uh, on competing interests in, in in many different areas is there any is there any are there any specific or unique features about this particular challenge that we're facing oh so um so i'm sure you'll be greatly interested to read our paper called delicate diagnosis which is in the british journal of general practice and what we were trying to do is look at um delicate conditions where external influences might be particularly challenging and difficult and one of the things that we thought about in particular was single issue clinics so clinics that are set up to deal with one particular problem who offer one particular solution and I think it becomes very difficult in that situation for a service not to provide the intervention for which they were set up to mm. prescribe mm. I, I, so I, I, I don't have any huge great answers for that because I can understand why women would want to go to a private clinic. I can understand um, why doctors would want to work in a private clinic. You know, they've got expertise, they want to use it, they see their, the benefits from things. But the problem that I have is that there is a massive list of things that are meant to um, possibly be caused by the menopause. And yet we don't always have very good evidence that that is the case. We've got sort of a few cardinal symptoms, you know, the basal motor ones in particular,
but everything else it's just so hit and miss and when you don't know for sure whether something's been caused by the menopause or not the temptation is to escalate dose escalate dose escalate dose and not actually consider whether your diagnosis was correct to begin with because you're working in an environment where this is the problem that you are treating and this is the problem that somebody wants treated and, and I think it becomes very difficult in that situation so that's a key issue and, and I think if your livelihood depends on a particular condition and you're um, prescribing for a particular condition it becomes very difficult you know and it, it's not impossible and I have you know I'm sure that there are many doctors with huge skill working in the private sector but I think it must be very difficult yeah okay um we'll go to the panel discussion shortly Charlotte any particular uh questions raised for, for Margaret yeah, um, so we've got one here on why is prescribing going up so much? Um, there's a 40% increase in prescriptions that Margaret mentioned, um, especially if GPs are doing the right thing. So do we know if GPs are being influenced by marketing messages as well as patient demand? Yeah, so the answer is we don't know. We just know that um, there's been an increase. It's been associated with a huge amount of more media coverage. So whether that's responsible or not, I don't know. Certainly, I, I do think that um, GPs want to help patients. And I think that women are entitled to make informed choices about things. So that's absolutely fine. What we don't know is whether women have got high quality information to make a decision about whether or not to have HRT. And it's very likely they're getting that from their doctors, whether they're getting that from the wider media and from information sites that they're accessing, we have less information about. Thank you. Any more, Charlotte, for Margaret? Um, yeah, so um, surely these issues are kind of not just specific to HRT, but um, general, so sort of private versus public versus pharma guidelines and practice. Um, so should we push any kind of regulations wider than just the HRT? Yeah, I mean, my, my classic um, example of this is, um, and, and I, I want to say that I'm, I'm putting private under a big umbrella, like there are clearly very high quality private organisations, you know, who are doing things very well and are, you know, cognizant of guidelines and are not doing anything um, sort of silly. So I'm not wanting to tar the same brush here. That would be really unfair. Um, but, but what I will tell you is, though, that a couple of years ago, I complained um, to everyone I could complain to about a clinic who was selling um, IV vitamins um, with the promise that this would help like depression um, libido, et cetera, et cetera, just unreal. And nobody effectively would regulate them apart from the Advertising Standards Authority. So the CQC weren't interested in the claims that they were making. The GMC weren't interested in the claims they were making. Nothing. So there's a big issue here. Um, and I don't know what the answer is because um, everybody seems to say it's not their job effectively. Hmm. OK, Margaret, stay with us because we'll continue the conversation. Charlotte, I'm going to give you a moment just to try and grapple with the rest of the questions that are, that are coming in. Then we'll put them to the we'll welcome our panel back shortly. Susan, now you're going to bravely try to summarise you know, what we think we've heard so far. Um, well, I don't think I need to summarise it <laughs> um, we've, okay. because people can watch. the. I think they can watch this again. Um, but we, we've got a lot we don't know. Um, it, the, the things that we have on offer are a lot better than when I was a student or my mother was uh, going through her menopause. So I think we have a lot more tools at our disposal and a lot more choices around uh, dosing or trying this or that or trying CBT or sleep, sleep hygiene. So it, it, in one way, we've, we've got a plethora of things to do. That still gives the problem of what will work for me and how can I tell whether the information is, is trustworthy or not? Um, and you know, one of the things that there's a consultation going on in government at the moment is about whether all uh, industry uh, will have to declare who it pays money to as individuals. And I think that's a useful piece of information. Why might you be telling me this? Are you an unbiased person or are you someone who, who benefits from the, the actions? And I think transparency whether it's transparent information on uh, you know, in academia or transparent information on declaration of interest is is always going to be helpful so i would think that the internet is a wonderful thing but it needs to be tidied up a bit with transparency yeah okay good um but well, let's welcome our our panel back so um Gillian, claire are you still there are you still with us if so, turn your video back on. Oh, there she is. Um, and also, I'm assuming we haven't got Martha, because Martha did say she might try and join us. Um, and then, Charlotte, are you back in the room? 
Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, so let's have a few questions for the panel. Okay, great. Um, so we'll start with what tools would you recommend for assessing symptoms of menopause and quality of life that can be used in clinical and workplace settings and in research? Um, and then kind of following on from that, have those tools been evaluated um, and against which gold standard? Okay, who'd like to take that? Jill? Uh, it's not really, um, it's not really my field, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, you know, that's something that I think probably, you know, people working in primary care research would have a better idea on. Um, I don't know if Margaret might have some information. No. <laughs> I'm delighted maybe to return to this one, Joe. That's a diff very difficult question. Well Margaret. Maybe. And then Claire, possibly. Then perhaps Susan will save the day by knowing the answer. I mean, there are I mean, there are definitions about how to diagnose menopause. You know, nice give those definitions there. You know, they, they do exist and you can use them. Whether everyone agrees that they are suitable and helpful or not is is quite another matter. But but they are they do exist. You know, they are there, and there are lots of tools that have been validated in different ways. Some international data, I think. You know, there's little bits of changes here and there. But, you know, there, there is stuff that's, in, that's defined in the guidance. Yeah, there, there, there definitely are clear definitions out there. Yeah, well, there's a 2020 protocol. I've just Googled, Dr. Google helped me here, uh, looking at a, what's called a crown initiative. That's trying to make all researchers work to the same agreed outcomes that matter to, to the patients. And that was 2020. So I don't think we've got an agreed outcome definition. And I don't think I've ever seen that there's been a James Lind alliance, which is where the known unknowns are turned into research questions. What is it that women actually want to know? Um, so, um, but there are scores, yep. Okay, Claire, is there anything in the workplace? What are there tools available in the workplace? You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. So when we've um, tried to capture menopausal status, we've used very kind of basic categories that are typically accepted of the perimenopausal phase, postmenopausal phase. So when did you last have your menstrual period, your last menstrual period, if it was 12 months postmenopausal? Um, it's, it's less than that, but you've had changes in your menstrual period, then that's perimenopausal. Um, and then usually, you know, of a certain age so but there are there are different measures even when you look at the reviews of the studies there are different um menopausal sim they call them menopausal symptoms but then are they menopausal symptoms or are they something else so i think sometimes they can get confused in between other general health symptoms um and what are menopause and what are not it's it's yeah it's it's big 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 question okay well i think we haven't been that I've also po I've just posted in the chat a okay. um uh, a paper on all the measurement scales for menopause. So if anyone's really interested, that's where they are. Okay, so there are some scales there, but it's part of unknown. I mean, known unknowns that we don't have all the answers. I mean, that's that, that's what we have to accept. Okay, Charlotte, well, thank you for that question. How about the next one? Um, yeah, so the next one we've got in um, asks: Is HRT used in Africa, and what effect does it have on women? Do we have data on the cultural differences and experiences of menopause? Yeah, I think this is, I saw a couple of questions around this, which is people saying, presumably whatever we know already is, uh, like most research is done in, uh, in, in, in Western sets, you know, in European or North American settings. Do we have data from other populations? I mean, I think we do. Yeah, yeah no, I, th I think we do. And I think, right. okay. in, yeah, in some of the other cultures, um, actually, the, the symptoms seem to be less prevalent. They seem to be less problematic. So um, like cultures like that seem to appreciate aging, for example, or health have healthy lifestyles like Japan, they seem to have less prevalence. And I remember reading a study um it was it was actually it was conducted in Africa about the experiences and perceptions of the menopause and in this particular study the menopause was seen as a really positive thing because in their culture once you experience menopause and gone through the menopause you could become a midwife and that was seen as a really kind of high status role in um, in their community in their society so actually menopause was seen as a really positive thing um, I think the West tends to have quite a negative view about menopause and aging in general, because the two are quite, 
quite linked. Mm. But equally, I guess in in some cultures there'll be underreporting, uh, you know, of, of, of how people are feeling and, and symptoms because culturally, you know, the voice of women is even you know less mm-hmm. in other parts of the world. Jill, I mean, I presume all the, the trials and studies you mentioned they will be in uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> US like, uh, settings. Yeah, I mean, like all sort of or most epidemiological studies, unfortunately you know, sort of ethnic minority groups and, you know, are are not very well represented and and same for the the trials. Um, And and that's something that sort of plagues a lot of the data that we look at. I mean, there there has been some analyses by by ethnic um, groups within the, the Women's Health Initiative. And actually, if I remember rightly, they did find some differences I think for for the effects of of HRT on stroke risk, um, with with higher relative risks in in women of black um, ethnic, you know, um, minorities. So there is some data, but it's really sparse. Um, and so you know we, we could do with a bit more data actually in in those groups. Thank you. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Uh, just a, just saying, a skimming PubMed. Um, we can find uh, formal scales where people have been asked uh, in clinics in Ethiopia, for example, and the numbers are looking like those 10% for urogenital pot flashes, things like that. They don't look fantastically different. But in Britain, it does look as though black women have more symptoms. Um, so I, you know, watch that, watch that space. It should be filled. Yeah. Thank you, Charlotte. Great. Um, the next question is, is there any reliable evidence for the use of testosterone, short and long term benefits and risks? <laughs> OK, um, Margaret. I had a horrible feeling you were going <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> you saw me looking at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So nicer, nicer reviewing this just now. So I'm hoping that they'll do a proper systematic review and we'll let us know kind of one way or the other. So certainly, you know, it is in the guidelines that is used for women who are on HRT and who have low libido despite being on HRT. So there is a method of prescribing it there. Um, and beyond that, and, and it's a small difference that, that it makes, it's not a massive difference. So we await NICE's review of all the evidence to let us know. Again, I just really worry that some of the claims are made for testosterone are well in excess of what the evidence-based benefits are that can be delivered. And that means that we are at risk, I think, of overinflating our claims. And that means then failing to actually investigate other options, investigate other avenues, consider what might else be needed, necessary, needing to be researched or tested. You know, it's um, there's a difference, I think, between um, no evidence for something working and a lack of evidence um, for whether something works or not. And I think that distinction is very much one of the one of the ones that we need to be quite clear about in, in these seminars, because I think we almost need, as Susan has said, you know, to generate something like the James Lind Alliance would, which is to identify the things that we wish we knew. But yeah. Would anybody else like to add to that? Um, no, just to say, uh, I think we need to get the evidence properly, curate, properly curated. I've been having lots of Twitter arguments with people about this. And um, whilst it does give a, uh, it seems to give some people a little bit of impression of something to the libido, testosterone is a drug that has got a lot of new indications for middle-aged men, for young young people with gender identity issues uh, now for women's sex lives to be improved. I'd be very anxious about the whole mythology that's going around about this. It might be a useful drug. It might be another of those poisons from which we can extract benefit in certain circumstances using the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. Um, but I, I would I would await nice. I mean, when we published a series of articles by somebody called Ray Moynihan, who's an Australian journalist about, about 20 years ago on manufacturing disease, um, female sexual dysfunction was one of the prime examples that we used about how industry was manufacturing that as a disease to then uh, sell treatments for. And so um, this may well be a way of, um, of, 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 of getting back into that particular debate. 
Um, okay. I, I, sorry, can I just throw yeah. in on that? I mean, I yeah. find it quite interesting. This, this, um, you know, the question of, of is there evidence for the effects of these um, of being prescribed testosterone? And actually, I think most people associate estrogens with um, hormone sensitive cancers in women. But actually, there's there's a very large um, piece of work which looked at endogenous sex hormones in relation to breast cancer risk. And what it found was that it's not just estrogens that are associated with with breast cancer risk, but actually testosterone levels as well. And of course, the two are are correlated. Um, But, you know, it did look in that analysis as if testosterone itself might have an independent effect on on breast cancer risk. So I'm just saying that, you know, because I I find that, you know, quite interesting when people are talking about, you know, women starting to be prescribed testosterone for for low libido. Um, I I don't think people necessarily make a connection with endogenous testosterone and, and female cancers, but, you know, there is some evidence there to suggest that it may actually be associated. Okay, thank you. Charlotte. Um, so we've got a question asking, what does the panel think about HRT and contraception being prescribed by pharmacies and competing interests now with the increase in prescribing abilities given to our colleagues? Okay, um, who would like to take that? Um, it's another prescriber question. I mean, Margaret, you're prescribing. Sorry to do this to you. Yeah, um, so so I think that the HRT that can be prescribed from um, pharmacies, or I think the one that's been able to be purchased over the counter from pharmacies is local um, vaginal oestrogen. So that doesn't really count as um, systemic um, HRT. So it's much lower risk for side effects. And, um, you know, so I think that's not HRT per se and probably will help some women and um, may not help other women um, you know, it, it's um, the, there are unfortunately a lot of women that end up buying a huge amount of caniston over the counter because they keep thinking they've got vaginal thrush because they've got itch and discomfort. But actually, if they'd have got the opportunity to speak to a healthcare professional, they might have been able to get a diagnosis of um, vaginal atrophy or you know menopause related um, symptoms with a better treatment available for them. So certainly there's that. In terms of contraception availability um, over the counter, I mean, you know, Already women get contraception from a variety of venues and um, the importance is um, shared decision making, autonomy, um, respect for confidentiality, joined up healthcare so that um, you're in a system where your needs are met and um, wherever they're best for you at that particular time. A bigger concern of mine is just about in fragmentation within the NHS. So one part of the NHS doesn't know what's happening to you and another part is prescribing for you at the same time. That's a big issue. Um, it seems to be getting worse rather than better, but I don't have any solutions for that. Um, but the, this idea about your GP record being your kind of cradle to grave, you know, depository of all the information about stuff that's happened to you is a hugely important thing not just for you but for research purposes as well you know at at various points and if we lose that because of fragmentation within the system that doesn't talk to each other or join up then I think we will lose a tremendous opportunity to understand where the benefits harms and risks are for women longer term. Thank you. Um, Susan would you like to add anything? Um, not particularly. Um, it does say something when we say you can self-diagnose, you can self-treat. Um, there is a possibility of a pharmacist doing it to a protocol and therefore having more time, filling in the questions better, going through the risks, being given a decision aid to make sure that the woman's understood the risks and benefits. So I can see a standardization uh, argument for making this, uh, if it really is an easy, simple over-the-counter one-off decision. If it's I'm taking a drug that um, I might take for life, uh, I I think that's quite a responsibility, um, both on the woman and the pharmacist and, well, I suppose the general practitioner normally, but, um, uh, you know, and we'd have to evaluate it, goodness me. Yeah. Um, You know, the amount of arguments we've had just on emergency contraception, a time-limited, you know, occasional problem, rather than this, which is going to be large numbers for long periods of time. Mm. I think it's that's, it's a very complicated question. Yeah. Thank you. I think, we'll, Charlotte, if you've got one more question, we'll take that. Then I'm going to go around the panel for a final comment, finishing with, with Susan, and then we'll close. Charlotte, do you have a more question for us? 
Yeah, um, so we've got a question, a kind of comment into a question here, which is that I think it's clear from what we've seen that there's little evidence for treatment of perimenopausal women, which should be corrected, we're worth the cost of the trials. So while I much prefer evidence-based treatment for myself, what am I meant to do when there is no evidence and apparently no appetite to generate it? Okay, well, this is the heart of the problem. Um, Jill, you tell us about the evidence. <laughs> better research more of it but yeah yeah I mean maybe the word lack of appetite for the trial is is was not quite correct it's not to say that you know as as researchers we wouldn't like to see more evidence particularly you know amongst the you know in in the context of you know is is this right for for you know there is there any sort of role for prevention um but you know the, the problem is that it is just very expensive to get these trials off the ground and um, I think, you know, there is scope for looking at some of these things in, in large, you know, cohort studies. And certainly, you know, things like the, the new sort of national cohort study that is going to be conducted or has already been started, Our Future Health, which will have women recruited into it, you know, using much more sort of contemporary preparations, perhaps using it, you know, at, at different ages, you know, we may get valuable information from from that study, um, but I agree it, it is a bit of a dilemma. I mean, Claire, in your area, I mean, you, you even said it was you know, getting more research done, addressing the right questions with the best methodological approach is, you know, is a challenge. It is. It yeah. is. But I think what what helps is when attention is drawn to it and if there's particular like government initiatives and reports and things that come out if there are studies that come out um like in the uk one of the biggest drivers of attention to menopause in the workplace was the um older workers report by ros altman in 2015 which was talking about how to keep our workforce going into old age as we're an aging workforce and one of the areas in there was the menopause that we really need to take that into consideration and it was that kind of government report that recognition that i think actually really pushed menopause and menopause in the workplace kind of there on the agenda but we do really need to get some sort of funding into it to start actually saying well do you know what let's get this going or another solution is to try and make workplaces sign up to come together to actually start collecting this data like what we were talking about before and sharing their data so that we can start doing almost like a natural data collection method um in and of itself which could be cheaper um and just and just keep it on going um but we really do. We really do need to, to do something about it. But I'm positive. I think I think we're going to do it. I think the more things like this and the more conversations and if everybody here talks to other people about it, I think it will fuel energy um, and I, I think it will come. OK, good. Right. I'll give you all 30 seconds in the in the order that you spoke. We'll give Susan a, a little longer. Uh, she's going to hopefully try and draw this to a, a, a conclusion. Uh, Jill. Final thoughts. Okay. Um, final thoughts. Well, I, I found it um, really, really interesting to hear all the other speakers actually, and and you know a lot of what they've they've been saying resonate with me in the sense that you know what I see in in the media and in the papers is not necessarily you know what what I I think is reflected in the evidence, and I think you know coming back to this point about how can we get more research funded, I think we have to be really honest about what we really don't know. Um, and, and, you know, that that's not really come filtering through to, to the, the public at the moment. It feels like they're being told that, you know, everything is great. And actually, there are some really major outstanding questions. And, you know, bringing these to the fore, I think, you know, will only be useful for the future because that's the way that we can secure funding to really resolve some of these these issues. Cameron's on mute, so I'm going to take my not even 30 seconds to say it's been a oh, wonderful webinar and I've loved the discussions that are going on in the chat. I think women are strong, powerful, resilient, angry, talented, and they're chatting to each other and actually answering each other's questions in the chat. And that's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing to see as well. Uh, Great. No other comments. Sorry, sorry about that. I went on chat uh, on mute by accident. Um, Claire, final thoughts from you. 
Yeah, it's been really nice to kind of hear people talking about the evidence and what we know and what we don't know. And, and just to keep that questioning approach of don't necessarily believe everything you see on the media and things that are out there. Like, you know, it's, in, it's, in, it's important that we try and get the right information. And I kind of, I feel for those who don't work in this area, who don't do research in this area, kind of the general public, how are they to know how are they to know what to believe and who to believe? If you can't believe Davina McCall, who could, you know, who can you, who can, you know, <laughs> you where Davina do we go <laughs> from there, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so, no, it's been really, really interesting. I think it's been a really, really good webinar. And I, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Thanks for participating. Margaret. So I really enjoyed it. Great to um, listen to um, people's different perspectives and, and the, the chat as well, which I will go and read um, properly. But I would really love to see a situation where um, doctors and patients are on the same side here. You know, researchers, doctors and patients on the same side, establishing what our known unknowns are, limiting bias, trying to avoid bias and working together to try and reduce the uncertainty as much as we can. We should be on the same side, you know, and I think it's a great shame that there's so much hostility um, around this um, particular arena just now because it's so unnecessary. And ultimately, I think everybody wants the best, either yeah. for the patients or for each other. So presumably doctors, patients and companies, Margaret? No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, so Susan, I mean, what... Where do we go from here? Um, I think that, um, well, I think we're over time and I'm not going to suggest that. <laughs> I just think that there's a couple of suggestions in the chat about women's sexuality um, and other questions that will be for your next webinar. OK, OK. But I mean, if you were to summarise, I mean, where it seems to me that, yeah. as we discussed, we said previously, all this talk of, every, you know, all women should be on HRT, to get them through the menopause is i mean it's not supported by the evidence i mean it needs no. to be on a case by case basis there's yeah. a delicate conversation about the balance of of of, of 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 benefits and harms um and you know and there's sort of acceptance that there are things that we know and think there's quite a lot we don't know as well so it's a it's a very nuanced conversation which isn't the way you would read it if you were to read um you know most newspapers and even listen uh, to the radio or, or what or what people talk about it on the news I think, you've summed it up. I think you've summed it up perfectly okay thank listen you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you all very much I think it's been really um you know a fascinating conversation it's been you know very I've had a great uh time learning about the evidence and um at the end of the day we've got to build a stronger evidence base to help inform uh clinicians and 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 patients as well so i hope we can work together uh, to achieve that so i'd like to thank all the panelists so that's um uh, Gillian reeves claire hardy martha as well for videoing and margaret mccartney thank you very much uh, and most of all susan Bewley for summarizing everything and being our co-host i thank my colleagues uh, george davy smith and uh, alison pollock for marshalling the questions and putting the seminar uh, this webinar together and of course charlotte who asked the questions and duncan who made it happen for the BMJ. And most of all, the participants, thank you for your really active participation uh, in the chat. It's been really uh, uh, rich and, and lively. And I think you know, this is an issue that clearly and understandably um, many, many people care deeply about and um, what are looking to health professionals and others to um, uh, help us get, help us to address some of these known unknowns. And I hope we can do that together so thank you very much today and look forward to the next time you can watch the video on youtube i hope sometime later today thank you goodbye i'm cameron abassi editor-in-chief of the bmj